want to welcome everybody to the Women's Summit for Careers in Football. This is the second of six sessions. Tonight's session, which will feature the Buccaneers General Manager, Jason White, their Vice President of Football Administration, Mike Greenberg, and their Director of Football Research, Jackie Davidson, will be about the team behind the team, how to build a championship NFL roster. And everybody in attendance tonight is in for a treat because tonight's episode is going to be a great one with great guests and great information and insights. And then coming up in the weeks down the line and the sessions down the line, there'll be one on scouting, one on player engagement, one on building a brand, and one on training. So everybody here is incredibly blessed and fortunate to be a part of such significant programs that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are running. I salute them, and I am happy and honored to be a part of this one. And with that, we will start tonight's program with the general manager, Jason Light. And Jason, I will ask you, the Buccaneers Women's Summit has not only increased the exposure of opportunities that exist in the NFL, but it's also paying dividends with the success stories throughout the league and right here in Tampa. How would you assess what this program has meant to you and the organization? No, it's been incredible. Um, you know, I feel Darcy and her family have always been at the forefront of inclusion, um, wanting to make this a very inclusive environment um, with the Buccaneers. They've always, first and, foremost, first and foremost, wanted to empower me to hire the best. But we also want to be inclusive. And then when we hired Bruce, when I hired Bruce a couple of years ago, he's a real pioneer when it comes to that with um, not only women, but people from all races and, and making sure that we're looking and, at, at everybody across the board of who we hire for various positions. So um, when we did the women's uh, career forum in February, Bruce asked for people to, women to send their resumes to him when it came to the coaching side. When I did the, talked about the scouting side, uh, I doubled down and did the same. And within a matter of a, you know, two, three days, my inbox was inundated with these <laughs> awesome, awesome resumes with a lot of people that I see right here. I recognize a few names. Jason, when you get those resumes that file into your inbox, what are the qualities that you and your staff are looking for? Well, I would say over the years, I've been in the business for, oh, geez, since 1995. I'm getting old. But it, the, one of the top qualities you find in someone that becomes successful in their field and rises through the ranks is passion. Now, you can't measure it. You can't ob objectively um, measure it. But when you see it, when you see it on paper, sometimes even, you know it. And people that have sacrificed um, to get their foot in the door and... Um, want to get this opportunity more than anything else in their life, it's people with this passion tend to be successful um, or have a much higher uh, chance of being successful than others. You know, Jason, you bring up passion. And I will tell you this, that that is a perfect segue into the quarterback of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Tom Brady, because there are not many people who are more passionate about what they do than Tom, as you well know. And I remember talking to Tom last year when he was a free agent. And I remember we were talking and I said, hey, you know, the Monday Night Football booth may come open, which ESPN was making a change. Is that something that would interest you? And his exact words to me at that point in the midst of what he said were, Adam, I dream of throwing the football. And I always remembered that. And I thought to myself, wow, I dream about a lot of different things but I don't dream of throwing the football the way that Tom Brady does. And I would guarantee you that on the 40 plus people on this call, many of you have dreams of doing what people like Jason or Mike or Jackie are doing today. You have dreams of being on a football team and in an organization like you do. And while we are on the topic of Mr. Brady, I will turn to Mike Greenberg, the Vice President of Football Administration for the Buccaneers. And Mike, I will ask you to recite the story for everybody of how and when Tom Brady signed his contract in an infamous story where mm -hmm. I would have been willing to do it if you wanted to, but you didn't need my services that night. 
you were next on the list of the person we're going to call. Um, but hi, everyone. Uh, glad to see everyone here. It's happy to be with you guys. Um, so the story Adam's referring to is last year during free agency, it was really right around the same time COVID started to ramp up. It was the you know, first week of March of last year. And um, even at our facility, there was only a few of us that actually were still remaining in the building and everyone started to work from home. Um, obviously a challenging time for everybody. And we, you know, free agency opens up and normally how it works is you agree to a deal and the player comes in the next day, uh, takes a physical and signs the deal. The problem is that travel restrictions wouldn't allow that to happen for us. So uh, Tom uh, was actually in New York City at the time. And, you know, we were just thinking he's in an apartment in New York City. There's no way he's got a printer, a scanner. And it's not like Tom Brady can easily walk down to Kinko's, print it out, sign a contract and send it back without any, you know, without everybody noticing and uh, uh, lining up in the street. So I, you know, we're just sitting there thinking, what, what can we do? And I happened to call my brother-in-law, who's 26, lives in New York City. And I said, hey, I just need a little small favor from you. Just a little tiny favor. I need you to print out this, this contract and I need you to go uh, to someone's apartment and sign it. His name's Tom. And he goes, just ask for Tom. I go, it's Tom Brady. I need you to go to his apartment and just walk him through the contract and, and have him sign it. So my brother-in-law uh, went to his apartment and just really them two and went through the contract and, and had him sign it and was the one who sent it back. So that is the only contract he has done ever. He worked at the league office for a little bit and he, is, he has done one contract and it is Tom Brady's. And so he was the one who actually was able to get it signed and executed and sent it to us so we can move forward. Speaking of signing contracts, Jackie Davidson, the director of football research, helped the Buccaneers become the first team in the salary cap era since 1994 to bring back all 22 starters from your team's Super Bowl victory. Tell me what is memorable about that process, Jackie, and what people in this audience could take from that experience. Um, first of all, good evening, everybody. I see a lot of familiar faces from uh, the NFL forum, and I think I helped interview a couple of you, so it's good to see everybody again. I think the, the most memorable thing about it was initially, I guess, coming to the realization that we really were going to try to sign all you know, 22 players back. And I think the biggest takeaway from it is sort of how you approach something that's seemingly insurmountable, right? The only thing you can do is take it bit by bit. Like if we, I think if we had the mindset, if, if me and Mike and, and Jason had the mindset of going in and signing all 22 at once or, you know, trying to do it all at the same time, we probably would have gone a little crazy. I think Mike and I almost did a couple of days. But when you go in and try to do it and say, okay, look, today we're going to try to get this accomplished. The next day we're going to hit, you know, these players. And you, you attack a problem piece by piece a little bit at a time. It becomes a little bit more more manageable for you. But the I think the scariest part and the most memorable part was was figuring out, oh, no, we're really – like they're really serious. Like we're really going to try to sign all these players back. Jason, I want to go back to you being on the road to becoming a general manager. I want to ask you to look back. And tell me when there might have been a turning point in your career that put you on the trajectory to hold the job and position that you do today. Well, you know, I think about this often. I talk about this with my wife, Blair, often. Um, I've been worked for six different teams. I think it's six. I'd have to go back and look. But um, kind of moved around the country a lot, uh, moving up. Um, getting promotions or moving out to get a take a promotion, whatever, throughout my journey to to want to become a GM. And now I have my um, the greatest job in the world working for the Tampa Bay Bucks and we won the Super Bowl. So um, but there was a point when I wasn't we talked about patience before when I wasn't so patient. And that's why I, I brought that up. Um, hmm. You know, you're you're thinking you're you're young, you're moving up. You're getting a lot of praise. Uh, you're in a good position, and you're in an organization where you think you have a chance to continue to rise. And that was when I was with the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, that kind of attitude I had made me um, 
be a little bit, not I will say jealous, but I was always, I was looking at the wrong things. I was looking at people and other teams getting promoted, uh, getting GM jobs. I was getting upset that why not my, why isn't it me? <laughs> and eventually it led to, I, I got fired. And when I got fired, I got humbled. And I got humbled and I took a job with the Arizona Cardinals. And from that moment forward, I was a different person. It was, don't worry about what the future is. Worry about what you're doing now and, and do it, do it at your best, do it at, to your best ability and do your job and be a teammate with the people working around you. And when you win, everybody wins. You know, it's interesting you say that. I'm just thinking, and I know that I'm, I'm not included in the panel, but I would hope I could weigh in with some insights of my own here. And you spend so much time when you're younger worrying about getting to that next station in life and how to get there. And I think as you get older, you come to recognize and realize that the less time you spend thinking about that and the more time you put into your current job, if you just focus on that, the chances are probably greater that you're going to advance to the job that you were worrying about if you're not worrying about it. Just do your job every day, right? Concentrate on that and everything works out. Enjoy it along the way. Mike, how about you? When you look back to getting into the position you're in today, What's a piece of advice that you could offer to this audience that would benefit them about how you were able to climb into the position you're in today? I think, you know, use all the resources that you have. Um, I was able to get to the Jets. Ironically, my dad owns a moving company and Mike Tannenbaum, the GM of the Jets, happened to be moving, used my dad's moving company. And <laughs> at the end, my dad's like, do you mind if my son reaches out to you? And then I was able to get an internship for Mrs. Jackie Davidson. So I was Jackie's intern at the Jets. And I think really once you, everyone kind of has a story like that. They had a connection, they had, they met someone, they were able to get their foot in the door. But then once your foot's in the door, then it's on you. It's on you to do whatever you can do to show your value, show your worth, um, you know, do projects, take on things that maybe not, or in the, you know, the field that maybe you don't want to work in, but just show that you can do different things and, and, and just be like, kind of like Jason said too, like be grateful you're, you're there, you have the opportunity to make the most of it. Don't always look to see what else you can be doing when you're advanced. Um, but that's the thing, like everyone kind of has a story where they were able to get their foot in the door, but then it's on you and then just give it your best and, and show why you deserve to be there. And uh, so once you have that, that opportunity, make the most of it. Jackie, you're, takeaway from reaching the mountaintop of the National Football League? It was one of the things going back to what Mike said, you know, we've known each other for over a decade now. And, you know, I, I talked to him after some of those hard losses, even before I worked here in some of those years. So knowing the amount of work that, you know, I put in even long before I was here and sort of what, you know, was accomplished, it was a very overwhelming feeling when you really thought about what had just happened. This is what this is the thing we all work for, right? Every every team goes into the year, and this is what this is what you're doing. So it was very, um, you know, it was a whirlwind of a year, just with on a personal level for everyone coming off pandemic, and personal level for me because I had come here and I'd literally just been working for the Bucks for like a handful of months. Um, so getting to that point, it was it was very emotional, and then going to what going to what Jason said, you had to remember to kind of stop and enjoy it. It's like he was talking about, I'm at the boat parade. And I'm like, we got to resign that guy. We got to resign that guy. We got to, and it's like, you can't even enjoy the moment. So you have to remember to, to do that. But what is, what's been great about it is our entire sort of last couple of months have been like peppered with, with something having to do with the Super Bowl. So you've been able to kind of drag it out a little bit. Um, but we'll put a, we'll close it out tomorrow. And then, you know, like he said, get ready to try to do it again. We'll close it out right here. Jackie, I want to thank you for your time and your insight. Mike, I want to thank you for your time and insight. Jason, I want to thank you for your time and insight. I want to congratulate uh, this entire group on winning the Super Bowl. I want to congratulate the Buccaneers organization for putting on the Women's Summit for Careers in Football. The second installment essentially uh, is now underway. And I'm going to hand it off to Tara, who's going to take everybody into their breakout rooms. I want to thank you all for your time tonight and hope that you enjoy what's left of the team behind the team, how to build a championship NFL roster. Thank you.
At this time, we're going to go into our breakout rooms. Hi, Mike. My name is Erin. I am the director of on-campus recruiting at Ohio State, and I am looking to get into operations. I know that the panel talked about being patient and being good at your job that you're focused on right now, but what advice would you give to those of us that are currently working recruiting, looking to move into more of an administrative and operations role? First of all, you all have very impressive <laughs> jobs and uh, I, very impressive. Um, good question. I think you're in a great spot. And what, when I get calls and people ask for advice, I always, you know, obviously I'd say the league, the teams, internships are a great way to get your foot in the door because really to learn the salary cap, the hard part is there's not really books on it. You, you kind of learn it once you're in it. Like I learned it obviously when I was interning with Jackie and, you know, it was an internship. She could take the time to teach me and, but it's, it's hard. You, you kind of, it's hard to get your foot in the door at a club and the league. So my recommendation to people is always go to colleges. And, and because when you're out of college, first, you're doing a lot. You're not, I'm sure you're not just focused on recruiting. They, it's all hands on deck at college and you're probably doing a lot of things and don't even realize that you're doing a lot of things and being exposed to a lot of different areas. We love hiring people who work at colleges because of that very reason. Um, and then you're also probably getting exposed to a lot of scouts that come in or general managers that come in or even coaches that are there that are gonna go to other places. So you're building a network and probably not realizing that you're building a network yet, but the first place we, when we hire, we start with scouting assistants and the first place we go to is we go to our road scouts and we said, have you come across anyone out of college that you're impressed with? And that's really where we've hired most of the scouting assistants from. Hi, my name is Kelly Masker, and I'm currently the director of football recruiting at Abilene Christian. Um, so I know that in the first panel, you did mention about qualities you are looking for in a candidate. But to extend on that with the mantra of the Bucks being one team, one cause, how do you make sure that that reflects in the candidate that you're looking to hire? That's a great question. And it's one that you can't, uh, just like I talked about passion, you can't um, objectively measure. It's <laughs> from having conversations and also conversations with people that you work with and you work for, um, we try to vet, do the best job at vetting the, uh, the candidate. But it's also, I think everybody deserves an opportunity. And when you get, when you're hired, if you're qualified and we feel you're very intelligent and you have a, a, a great upside, I think when you have an environment that we finally have built here um, in the last you know, seven years that I've been here, because um, I have some great people that I'm working with that do a phenomenal job and I owe them all the credit in the world for where we're at right now. But the atmosphere that we have, it's hard for you not to join in forces with it. You have to have a great, just like a team has to have a great culture in the locker room, which we have the best that I've ever been around, selfless. We have some great big personalities, a lot of egos, which is fine because you need egos for players to want to go get sacks, you know, to want to be their best. But at the end of the day, all of our players are selfless and want to win. That's all they want to do. And that's the same with, with, the, with the office, with the people working in the front office. It's, we want the same type of attitude. My name is Joy. I just finished 11 years in the service as a Naval Intelligence Officer and a couple of months into my new role with the Cleveland Browns. My question is, in the first year of your tailor-made role, what were your guiding principles and what did you use to benchmark success? The biggest two I would say is um, adopting sort of a, a learning and adaptability mindset. And then the second was communication. And so the first thing I did when I got here was sort of devise a, a strategic plan and sort of here's, okay, here's what I'm thinking for this role. Here's what I think it looks like. Here's where, you know, I'd like to be after this year. This is where I'd like to be, you know, after this many months, I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to do this. Now, the first thing um, in doing that was one, figuring out sort of where the figuring out what the organization does and where it is in terms of what it does and, and learning and learning about how different people operate in different departments. You know, the entire season, I kind of spent the time trying to learn and sort of adapt and get it and get a feel for what the organization was like and what the, you know, not just the expectations, but how people, you know, it's one thing to know how I want to do something. It's another way to know how people want it done. 
And that's, uh, so it was that first part was just a learning part. And then the next was, like I said, the communication part and kind of outlining, here's what I think and making sure if everybody was on the same page and kind of thinking along those same lines. The name, image, and likeness rights released to players that just recently happened on the collegiate level uh, is set to make a difficult decision for a lot of student athletes because now they have to decide when to go pro. Like, how is it this going to affect, like, when is their draft stock going to be the highest? How much money can I make as the local school favor, especially in places like Nebraska, where, you know, you're you're actually very highly valuable on the market. Do you see all these developments um, in the NIL rights affecting your work uh, and your scouting staff's work? Um, and how about the NFL in the future as a whole? That's an excellent question. And I, I guess time is going to tell on that. There's, there's a lot of players that are, that come out in the draft, that enter the draft um, as underclassmen that we, every year, there's a lot of them that we don't feel are ready to come out yet, but they do. They still get drafted you know, we may still draft one or two of them, you know, um, at, at where we feel is the right price, but at the right value. But a lot of them aren't ready because, but they do it because they want the money, you know, whatever it is, take care of their family. Um, you know, they want the flashy car, whatever it is, they come out. Now, I think this will cause them to, uh, or, or have them press pause a little bit and realize that they can take care of their mom, take care of their family, take care of their father, whatever it is. Um, while still playing college football and then actually develop even more in college and be more pro ready when they're ready to come out. So I think there's going to be some positives to that. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Toth. I am the director of football operations at Quincy University. Um, my question is, what attracted you to the position with the Bucks, and how did you make sure it was the right fit for your next step? It started with, you know, being compatible with, with the people. And I don't, I can't, you know, stress that enough. And a lot of times, like I said, you know, we'll jump on opportunities because, you know, there's, there's few of them and it's like, okay, well, this is only one. If I don't get this one, then, you know, will it come back around? And that's important, but you also have to think about, you want to put yourself in the best position to be successful as well. And sometimes, um, sometimes that may mean saying no to something that looks perfect it might be saying, you know what, that's not the right opportunity for me. And just waiting for that opportunity to come around. Cause you can't, regardless you know, of what people say about just go in there and make it work. That's not, that's not reality. Like, you know, the reality is, is that every job is not for everybody. And you have to find the job that is for you and right for you.